we started this series and we touched on the environment of glory. And, and for years I've preached on an aspect of that environment, and that's home. So as Christian parents, you have to take special time to spend with those little ones and encourage them, teach them. It says to train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from the faith. We have an America today that's an example, and, and it's in a negative sense, but it's an example of what works. The devil, the devil convinces people, you're wrong and that won't work, and then takes the very principles that he's convinced us of that will not work, and in a negative sense, causes them to work into an entire nation. And we've seen the ruination of school districts. I, I don't even recommend college anymore to, to, to young people. It, 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 if you want your young people brainwashed, by all means, send them to college. Now, I know all my children are college graduates, but Jay had to fight tooth and nail, especially when he was going to community college, to fight with the professors on what they were trying to cram down his throat. He was smart enough to know the difference, and they didn't like that. And uh, Jamie is a little different than Jay. Like, for example, uh, when she attends a Catholic uh, wedding, or funeral for that example, for that uh, fact, they practice closed communion, and so they say, in a sense, if you're Catholic, come up, we're going to serve you communion. She's not Catholic, but she gets up and goes up there and takes communion. Why? Because she's born again. It's the Lord's table. And she has every right to gather at the Lord's table, and I believe that's cont contrary to Christ's doctrine. And so, so we, we see the e example all through America today of negative environment doing its best, all that it can, to destroy America. So we, we learned that the environment of glory was originally in the Garden of Eden. Heaven and earth met in the Garden of Eden. God came down and walked and talked in the cool of the evening and the day, the afternoon, and fellowshiped with his highest creation, man and woman. And then Satan enters the garden as a serpent and convinces them to rebel against God. And from that moment on, broken fellowship with God had a dramatic impact on the world. The first thing Adam and Eve did where they had fellowship with God, they hid from God. They, got, they said, we don't want to talk with God. We, we want to get away from him. Their innocence was lost. They were running around naked and jaybirds, didn't think anything about it. The minute they failed God, they started looking, as we humans will do, answers, and they made garments out of fig leaves. So they lost their state of innocence. They didn't want to be in the presence of God. I, I can tell when somebody's backsliding because the first thing they do is they don't want to be in church anymore. You all know what I'm talking about. And so, so that environment of glory was established in the Garden of Eden. And to keep them from being in a perpetual state of sin, because they had failed God. They, they were sinners. And he said, I can't let them live forever in that state. So he drove them out of the garden. You might say, well, that was a cruel thing to do. No. God had a redemptive plan immediately, but he had to have time 
to install that redemptive plan. So to keep them from, they'd already failed God once. What would, what would make God think they wouldn't go and eat from the tree of life? Where they would live forever in a state of perpetual sin. That was, that was a good God that did that. And so, so we, we, we learned much about the environment of glory. Then we ministered on keys to releasing your personal glory. Every human being here today has glory in them. You, you might not think you have because Satan has worked very, very hard to convince you that you are not glory to God. Your failures. And we help him because we reinforce that very thing with our own children. You'll never amount to anything. If we're mad at his dad, we'll say, you're just like your dad. And if dad's mad at mom, he'll say, no, they're just like you. Like somehow that's, that's an appropriate saying, a negative feedback. That, and then we say, well, what's wrong with our kids? We're what's wrong with our kids. Teachers are what's wrong with our kids. Satan knows God's principles work, but convinces you they don't, and then uses them. And so today I want to talk about glorifying God with our humanity. And I touched on this. Heaven is a temporary holding place for the saints of God. But our eternal abode is earth. I've, I've had many, many teenagers and young people say to me, I don't want to go to heaven because it sounds boring. And we've made it sound boring. You know, I've, I've had Christians tell me, yeah, we're going to be lollygagging around on clouds. Clouds won't hold you. Now we're dying. And by the way, when, when the environment was lost to Adam and Eve, what did they do? They started lying. They started blaming. What's her fault? So, so their, their character, their nature was totally changed. The whole process of redemption is God had to win back what Adam had lost. And he did it through the death of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Yet some of the songs you sang today vividly demonstrate, demonstrate what I see as glorifying God with our humanity. Gloria and Bill Gaither. That was a Gaither song you just sang. He, he had to write that. He, he had to pen it. He had to think about it. They had to come together and most of their songs, they, they do them together. And at one time, uh, he had a trio with his brother. They sing for years. And yet, the devil convinces us that you're self-centered and egotistical if you show any kind of glory in your life. Your glory is God's glory. And so, so we're going to talk about that today. Because we enjoy man's glory every day of the week. How, how, how many people got up and zipped up their clothes today? All of us. Somebody invented the zipper. Somebody gets glorified every day millions of times because they invented the zipper. Or are you, are you button your clothes? Somebody invented a button. Then we go out and get in a car and demonstrate somebody's glory like Ford, who really is the father of the modern car, the first car Ford ever made, he forgot to put reverse in it. But it didn't stop him. He went, he went back and, and he got it, finally got it right. And we, we know no bounds or limits because 
We drive all the time. That's somebody's glory. We're, we're getting ready to fly out Wednesday, and we'll be on a plane for 14 hours to get to Rome and Greece. The, the Wright brothers worked and worked and worked and worked and worked to keep their first plane in the air so many seconds. So every time we get on a plane, we, we glorify the Wright brothers and all those that came before the Wright brothers because they, there was only one book that was produced about airplanes. He went to the Smithsonian, got the book, read it, and he was forever fascinated with flight. His brother was sick and in bed, so he was a captive audience, and his brother read to his brother, and they both became obsessed with flight. We take it for granted. So every day we enjoy the benefits of someone else's glory. The world has no problem with this. They put out magazines, they got TV shows. We, we love to watch when Michael Jordan was in his prime, it looked like he was flying forever. And he's a rich man today because of his talents and his ability and willingness to release his talents. Every, every time you go to someone, and we have this all the time, pastor, I think, and then they express their dream, but then they pass it over and they say that you should do it. That, that's your glory. There, there are, everybody in here has glory and it's different than everybody else's. So when you don't fulfill your glory, guess where it ends up? In the cemetery. It dies with you. I, I've, I, my biggest thing with abortion, and I'm not trying to put anybody under bondage. God is redemptive. God can forgive. I believe that. But I, I wonder, have, have we aborted 5, 10, 100 babies that would have already by now found cures for cancer? When we aborted them, their dreams died with them. Their, their glory died with them. I, I'm trying to get us to understand in this series that you are unique. You are, you are marvelously made, the Bible says. And in your uniqueness, there's no one else like you. And so, so when we fail... And I like the book Chasing the Lion because his theory is you, have to, you should be dreaming so big that you need God to help you fulfill your dreams. It's okay. I, I used to be this way. When, when I first got in the ministry, somebody would come up to me and they would go on for 25 minutes about a dream or a desire they had, and I, and I really, I would go, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of in my life. Not realizing that was their dream, and with God's help, they could have fulfilled that dream. There are people here today that I cannot do what you can do and bring glory to yourself, when in essence, glory for you is glory for God. The devil's been lying to us. So, so I, I'm going to put it in my first point. The glory of God is humanity's fully alive. Like, like the world has a saying. People who are extremely successful, they say, you have arrived. Have you ever heard that? You've arrived. She arrived. She, he arrived. Simply because they were manifesting this great glory of their lives. Unique voices singing, praising, writing. And, 
A finished book is the author's glory expressed. When, when God impressed upon someone here, more than probably someone, sit down and write a book on your life, which, which you came out of, what, what God has done with you. He was simply trying to, to express your glory, and then he receives glory because of it. So there is God-given potential in every son and every daughter of God. And your, and your job, if you have children, is to see that potential and bring it out of your children. Create an environment where they can grow and they can expand and they can fulfill. They, they may show exceptional Artistic ability when they're very young. You, you, you need to, to channel that. You need to work with that. Or, or I, I could sing when I was a little tiny kid. I, I had neighbors. I can remember my sister walking around the neighborhood and they would say, we call, I called her Smacks, okay? And they would say, Mackie, bring your little brother over here and let him sing for me. And my mom put me on a stage in a church when I was about three or four years old. And I've been singing ever since. Not as good as I used to, but I'm still trying to glorify God with my talents. So, so all that Satan does to you He's got a purpose behind that. He's trying to bind up and suppress this God-given glory. So you can't hit the high notes like you used to. Sing lower. The world says, you know, physical size or wealth, finances, money, is an accurate measure of one's true worth. That's not true. Hey, have you ever stopped? And, and I, I know what everybody's going to say. Well, God can do anything, so he, he doesn't have to. No, he doesn't. I get it. But did God make a Stradivarius? Or did a master make a Stradivarius? Did God write instead of Mozart? Or did Mozart write? Or Bach? Or Beethoven? They wrote. And you might say, and it would have never happened because God doesn't always step up and say, you won't, so I'll do it for you. We, we think he should do that. He's not going to do that. He expects you to do it. I, I've never heard God come down and say, okay, one with a great voice, sit down, I'm going to get up and sing in your place. I've, I've never in all my years in the ministry had that experience where God told someone to sit down, he was taken over and he sang. And I, and I without reservation, would say, if anybody is surpass that and has seen God do that, raise your hand. Nobody here is going to raise their hand because it isn't going to happen. So what does that tell us here today? We're God's eyes. We're God's voice. We're God's hands. We're God's feet. As, as crazy as that sounds, and our tendency is to say, well, God can do anything he wants to, so you're contradicting everything you're saying. No, I'm not. I, I'm telling you, I've never seen God do that. I, I brought this, you know, God told me to sit down. I don't know if I brought it up here or not. Yeah, here it is. Sit down and, because there are entire denominations that say the ministry gifts that Jesus gave to the church. Talk about presumption. We don't need them anymore because they were for the first century church. 
You don't find that in the Bible. You don't find that on the day of Pentecost, after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit fell, all the gifts of the Spirit were taken away because they were only for the first century church. You know where that came from? That came from man's doctrine. Church doctrine. And you don't find it in the Bible. So I sat down and I wrote, Ministry Office, Christ Gifts to the Church. So this, whether you like hearing this or not, this is my glory to ultimately glorify God. Amen. Two weeks ago, a man from a large denomination said, I didn't know what he was going to say. I never met this guy before. He sits down with me. I couldn't make him be quiet. I was really looking forward, Santos, to, to the tamales. I, I, I ate about this much tamale because I couldn't make the guy shut up. He says, do you believe in the ministry gifts? I said, well, yeah, I do believe in the ministry gifts. I said, I, I wrote a manual on the ministry. You did? Then he proceeds to tell me uh, his church, and I'm not going to tell you who, where, it, where it was. Now, they don't believe in the ministry gifts. But then it led, and I told you, many, many occasions, be careful. I, when I used to help my dad paint, especially floors, I used to paint floors. I was so stupid I'd paint myself into a corner. Instead of painting myself out of a corner to a door, I would turn around, I was up against a wall, and I'm going, well, how am I going to walk 30 feet on wet paint and get out of here? <laughs> That's the stupidity of man. Then he proceeds to tell me, and they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, they think that that was for the installation of the first century church. I taught yesterday on the prayer meeting, I said, we need the gifts of the Spirit more now than we've ever needed them. I don't, I don't even know how people intercede without gifts of the Spirit. What do you pray for? Who do you pray for? Revelation comes to you and you go, hey, we need to pray this way or we need to pray that way. The Bible says we're made a little lower than God. Can you imagine that? A little lower than God. And David, who spent many, many nights a shepherd boy, contemplating the heavens above him. How did it benefit him? How did being a shepherd boy, how sleeping out under the stars, looking at the constellations, Benefit him. Here's one of his writings, Psalms 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of, of them? Human beings, that you can care for them. You have made them a little lower than the, here he says, angels, but the Bible really says God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. Now the devil's telling you you're nothing, but God is saying, I'm going to let you rule over every living thing, everything that flies, swims, crawls, you're going to be over them. I mean, I mean, for actually, Satan is an out of work bum, and we're listening to this guy. When when he rebelled against God, he and all the unholy angels were kicked out of heaven. They don't have a job. Their job is to try to convince you. Why would you listen to a bum? And he goes on. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. 
Now, when David considered the heavens, he was impressed not with his smallness, not with the smallness of man, but with the greatness of God. That's the way we ought to be. We serve a great God. I can do anything in the name of Jesus. God says we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Notice what David states. What is man? You have made him a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty. That's what we need to remember today. All, all, all you hear on the radio is retirement, retirement, retirement. Do this, do that. Reverse mortgages, on and on and on. So you can retire early. We're, we're talking about glorifying God with our humanity. Why, why do we stress that all the time? I stress re-enlistment. For the first time in many of your lives, you can work full time for God. You can pray for hours. David understood the highest state of man in God's design, so when he went out and Goliath had the whole nation of Israel cowering, he said, this guy's nothing but an uncircumcised Philistine. And killed him as a youth. He got it. Just because... I'm little in the sight of creation doesn't mean that I'm weak in power and authority. And yet, think about the world. Think about this. I, it's, this has always amazed me. And never do this. Never exchange God's glory for worthless idols. Can you imagine... We have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with our God. We can communicate with Him. We can pray. He hears us. He answers prayer. One of the most obvious signs of man's loss of identity is the countless and fruitless ways that people throughout history have attempted to satisfy spiritual yearnings. I mean, Moses comes down from communicating with God and the glory of God is all over him to find his people worshiping a calf. A grass-eaten cow. Or, or they'll find a twig and shape it into something. Our, our, I, I watched history yesterday a little bit. How the Sphinx is not quite in line with the pyramid. And when, once a year when the setting of the sun, because they were sun worshipers, and they thought this dead body that we've dug up 5,000, 6,000 years later looks like a piece of burnt toast, wanted to receive the power of the sun so it could resurrect. And how dumb man is because we see all this remnant junk and a stinking 5,000-year-old body, but, but we admire what they've done. What is there to admire about worshiping false gods? What is, what is an idol? I, I preach on this a hundred times. An idol is anything that we place more importance on or give more allegiance to than we do God. Amen. This is what Deuteronomy 32 
says, The Lord saw this and rejected them because he was angered by his sons and daughters. I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, children who are unfaithful. They made me jealous by what is no God and angered me with worthless idols. I will make them envious by those who are not a people. I will make them angry by a nation that has no understanding. God. God is so succinct. He, he cuts right to it. Here's what he says in Psalms 106. At Horeb they made a calf and worshipped an idol cast from metal. They exchanged their glorious God for an image of a bull which eats grass. God challenges his people in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2. God said, I will not give my glory to another. He's a jealous God. Acknowledging our God given gifts and exercising them without shame or apology is not stealing God's glory. You've been lied to. It's, it's, you're manifesting God's glory. We're giving Him glory. My last point is the glory of productivity. We, we take pride. You know, I've had people say this, man, how lucky Adam was. He just laid around and ate nectarines and grapes. And they, they could see him laying in a hammock and flipping a grape up and catching it. That's a TV commercial. God, God told him to be productive. God told him to multiply. God told him to fill the earth. God told him to tend the garden. This is, this is the devil making people believe that it's a great thing to do nothing. I, I, Charlene and I have always been blessed, but we've always worked. People get mad at me. Well, you're telling me that I have to work? Yeah, if you want to be blessed. <laughs> it's true. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I, I, you know, I didn't, no sugar mama, no sugar daddy. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Be careful what you wish for. God di did not create us to do nothing. He gave us intelligence and gifts in order for us to use them for service to others. I, I've always said this. The main reason God wants to bless you is for you to bless others. I, I used to dread go to the post office because there's always people camped out there. Now, I, now I, I look around. Before I come out, I get into my wallet, and I bless somebody. Because God blesses those who bless the unfortunate. That's, that's the way you get blessed. I don't know what Bible people read, but I, Charlene, like, she, in Christmas time, she never passes a salvation army. I spend more time wait, waiting for her to find money and change and stuff. And, but I'm stupid because I, I can't even think of what I want for Christmas. I, I don't know where to put it. I'm ashamed to tell you that, but it's true. God is glorified 
when we find crea creative ways to give full expression to his nature and attributes and to the life of Christ that swells within us. We find our glory in becoming everything God created us to become. That's where we find our glory. I'm, I've said this every week. Dream dreams that are so big that you have to have God help you meet them, make them. Amen. We, we don't think big enough. So what principles have we covered? God created us a little lower than himself. As an, an idol is anything that we place more importance on or give more allegiance to than we do God. Whenever we bow before an idol, not only are we worshiping something that is lower than God, we are worshiping something that is lower than ourselves. Acknowledging our God-given gifts and exercising them without shame or apology is not stealing God's glory. On the contrary, it is a way of giving him glory. God will not allow his glory to be given to man-made idols. God will not allow his people, the carriers of his glory, to prostrate his image before idols. We've got to learn how to take these fragile jars of clay that are our bodies and turn them into goblets of glory. We should live so close to the Lord that when people look at us, they will see him shining out of our lives. God does not want us to take our gifts and talents and abilities to the grave unused. When we exercise our creativity, we are displaying the godlike attributes and nature and his nature that he placed in us. God is glorified when we find creative ways to give full expression to his nature and attributes and to the life of Christ that swells within us. And finally, we find our glory in becoming everything God created us to be.